Good afternoon. Thank you, Roland. Uh, here I am once again. Um, this uh, paper, Burial Assemblages versus uh, Resource Assemblages, a look into the economic background of Iberian Copper Age megalithic graves, results from our ongoing discussions about uh, resources in southern Iberia and collaboration between the University of Seville and the University of uh, Tübingen. And um, uh, it's um, intended as a, as a bit of an exploration of um, uh, how we can connect the reality that uh, we see inside these burials, the material reality, the deposits, especially um, as far as the lithics is concerned, and the geological landscapes or the geological resources or the geological environment, if you prefer, um, around surrounding these tombs at these uh, sites and these, at these locations. Um, so to, in order to explore this, um, <clears throat> uh, the relationship between society and resource use, um, we are making a particular focus on the role of uh, resources in the construction of landscapes. The questions uh, are, uh, the basic question is, um, how do burial assemblages mirror resource assemblages, if they do at all? And in order to achieve this, we will be looking at two case studies from Copper Age Southern Iberia. Mm, two tombs, Montelidio and Palacio III, which are contemporary, uh, dated in the third millennium, probably in the early part of the third millennium. Um, uh, we have different chronologies for these two tombs. Montelidio is very well dated by C14, by a series of 22 dates, and we know exactly when it was used in the 29th century BC. Whereas for Palacio III, unfortunately, no radiocarbon date is available, but the fact that there is no uh, Belbiker pottery associated with it makes it likely that it's, uh, it corresponds to the Prebiker phase of the Copper Age, therefore roughly contemporary with Montelidio. These two tombs are located in rather different physical environments. Montelidio in the lowlands of the Guadalquivir uh, River Valley and Palacio III in the Sierra Morena uh, Highlands. They represent very different scales of monumentality, as we will see in a minute when I show some photos. And they both um, uh, include or have now available detailed studies uh, of the material culture, including quantification of all finds and provenancing of artifacts, as well as to some extent functional analysis. This is, I would say, basically the only two coverage tombs in southern Spain for which at the moment this comparison is possible because uh, for many other tombs that have been excavated, the uh, um, evidence in terms of the data, in terms of uh, characterization of the raw materials is not there or is not complete very often. So some issues to look at. Um, four main issues. Was there a personal or group identification with the locally available resources? What was the role of non-local, even exotic, resources in these tombs? What are the similarities and differences in the relationship between local and non-local resources among both burial assemblages? And what does that tell us about the society, the ideology and landscape making of that time. So a quick um, um, review of these two tombs, uh, both located in southwestern Spain, in the province of Seville. As I said, Montelidio is in the lowlands. You can see here the Guadalquivir River, uh, which uh, this is the uh, Paleo coastline, uh, the coastline um, of uh, 5,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago, how it would have been approximately, very different from what it is today. This is all marshes nowadays. And this is the location of modern day Seville here. Parque de Miraflores is located within, uh, within the city. And this is Valencina de la Concepción, which is where Montelidio is located. So we have Palacio three here and Montelidio here distant some, some 70 kilometers. Palacio III is uh, a megalithic complex that includes various monuments. Um, I will not dwell into the description of those monuments. 
Um, the comparison we are making refers only to the Tholos type monument uh, from the Copper Age. You can see various photos of the excavation process of this uh, monument. It's basically a corridor and circular cha chamber monument, the chamber being approximately two and a half meters in diameter. Uh, no human remains were found here because of the high soil acidity, a problem that we encounter very frequently in this region. But um, a relatively you know, sizable collection of artifacts and material evidence was recovered from this tomb. An interesting aspect of this tomb in particular is the use of these slate slabs that uh, line and surround the chamber uh, um, and which are very uh, fine pieces of work because they have been cut and uh, carved carefully and that then were used uh, to paint uh, decoration on them. So the remains of this decoration inside the burial cham chamber has been reconstructed by professors Mimi Bueno and Rodrigo Balvin. What you see here is a reproduction from their work and um, basically, this is an interesting example of how, in this particular case, the stone is not used in the architecture with a functional um, uh, sense or purpose, but rather simply as a canvas on which uh, the painting was made. So it's, uh, you know, the slate provides a smooth, regular surface, which is, you know, shiny, polished and, and uh, beautiful. And on top of this, uh, the, the users of this tomb painted several motifs. Well, you know, we could say, we could say a lot about this use of the, of the stone here, but I, I will move on. So basically, when you look at the architecture of this tomb, and I think that could be extrapolated to practically any megalithic monument in Iberia, and of course in Europe, you see that there's some strong patterns of use of different lithic resources and different rocks. To give you just a quick example, um, you see how this red conglomerate in this particular tomb was used exclusively uh, uh, to make like an atrium um, at the entrance of the tomb that would have been separated from the rest of the corridor through a gate. We didn't find the gate, but we found a uh, groove carved on the bedrock that fit exactly for a little portal made of wood possibly that would have closed and sealed the tomb while it wasn't in use. So those three slabs, two marking the entrance and one as a capstone, symbolize the access to the tomb. And this is the only part of the tomb in which this particular type of rock was used. It is also interesting if you notice this. One of these slabs, it's actually a little sculpture. It's a Stella. It's a very nice, uh, nicely carved piece of rock that, again, according to Mimi Buenos and Rodrigo Balvin's interpretation, would have represented a female figure, again, painted and uh, carved with various motifs. So this is uh, interesting because the, the position of this uh, figure, of this Stella, is obviously protecting the entrance to this monument and it's presiding over the access into this uh, burial chamber. So you, could, you can say that it has an apotropaic uh, function. So it's a very precise uh, use of a very, uh, you know, um, a specifically selected rock type within this tomb. So the same applies to another stella which was found on the upper part of the infill of the tomb, which represents the later uh, stages in the use of this tomb Again, I'm using here the interpretation by Mimi Bueno and Rodrigo Balvin. And this uh, is a very interesting stella because uh, it's, it's morphology. It's very unlike um, most of what is known for the so-called megalithic art of this region. It is very parallelepipedic in shape. And then it was uh, painted with uh, anthropomorphic motifs, the eyes, nose, eyebrows, and possibly uh, some kind of weapon. So it's... Um, it, this represents a later stage in the use of the monument. So the uh, grave goods inside this uh, burial chamber include pottery, a fair amount of uh, lithics, including arrowheads and long blades, which, which are typical of the lithic technology of the third millennium. You have the counts 
up there, it's uh, approximately 100 nap lithic items, then some polished stones as well of different uh, material and fibrolite, fibrolite, which is interesting because this is not local, volcanic rock and rock crystal. Rock crystal is a very interesting um, appearance, uh, usually in megalithic monuments, and then a number of other objects that we can consider perhaps uh, more uh, ideotechnic, as, if, as it were, you know, charms or personal amulets or personal objects. And all these objects, which are here shown in this photo, um, have specific properties. You see, for example, these two uh, items are um, um, uh, hexagonal prisms of uh, uh, milky quartz, which are difficult to find. And some of them, both of them, show evidence of uh, use wear through handling. The same applies to this white quartz, which, um, believe it or not, is, is white, but it has a very interesting property because it has veins of iron that make it reddish when it's placed against the light. Against the light, this oval-like uh, object that looks a bit like an egg uh, has a very strong organic appearance to it. So these are all special objects. This one here is fossil wood, which is interesting because in this region, there's uh, evidence of um, uh, fossil uh, forests with the tree, fossil tree trunks and so on. So basically, these people, the users of this tomb, were knew perfectly well every single detail of the geological environment in which they were living, and they were making use of all these resources very specifically for specific uh, purposes, both in the architecture and in the portable material culture. Oops, sorry. Okay. Um, just one fragment of uh, a, little, a photo of one uh, copper, copper item, the only copper item in this tomb, which proves that this belongs to the Copper Age. <laughs> uh, interestingly, against our assumption, uh, when this was analyzed and this, the, the uh, lead isotopes of this object were uh, looked at by Pechi uh, Murillo Barroso, she found that this isn't local uh, copper, which is a surprise to us because there's abundant local resources there in the region. This, the, the signature in the lead isotopes shows uh, a provenance from eastern Sierra Morena, some 200 kilometers to the east. Interesting, these people had this material locally available, but in this tomb, they chose to put something that was non-local. The copper is non-local. And um, uh, a little figurine, female figurine, in fire, clay, like uh, it's uh, common in many of these tombs. So, Monte Lirio, it's uh, another Copper Age tomb. In this case, uh, much more massive in, in size, instead of a chamber of two and a half meters and a corridor of two meters. We, are, we have a monument here with 36 meters of corridor and then a chamber of five meters, which would have been covered by a um, dome made of hardened clay, sun-dried clay, uh, that would have been as high, so probably five meters high. So it's a really, really big monument. Okay, I'm not doing so well. Uh, so, some quick uh, photos of, um, and uh, images of Montelirio. The use of uh, building materials here is very interesting. For example, there's a large number of slabs that were used in the corridor that are sandstone. And these sandstones were brought from a very specific location along what was then the sea or the coastline. And we know this because of the presence of several uh, bivalves several mollusks that are marine mollusks that were are uh, lithophags, uh, literally rock-eating uh, 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 mollusks. And um, this we find in La Pastora as well, which is another megalithic monument nearby. This is about 40 or 60 kilometers away, between 40 and 50 kilometers away from Montelirio. And um, it's interesting that the builders of this monument chose precisely these rocks to use for the roofing of the corridor. Again, it's a very deliberate choice of material, which uh, we suspect has some strong symbolical connotations. Here you have a quick impression of the uh, main burial chamber of Montelirio, where several um, individuals uh, were buried, especially women. I have to go a little fast. 
and the material culture that, interestingly, in this case, does not include any copper. It doesn't include any copper, but it includes several very fine objects made of uh, 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 rocks, of lithics, including this very special long barbed uh, arrowheads, a flint halberd, you can see there on the right, and some uh, objects made of rock crystal as well, which is a notoriously difficult to work uh, raw material. Different properties from the flint. Ivory and amber as well appear in this tomb in large quantities compared to any other uh, Copper Age monument in Iberia. Gold, and as I said, no copper. It's interesting that again, gold seems to be um, a, a, a raw material with a very specific use, as it is um, uh, used, uh, these gold foils were used to represent this eye motif or oculus that is very omnipresent and pervasive in late Neolithic and Copper Age uh, 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 iconography and in the worldview of these two millennia. Interestingly, these cases of uh, oculi uh, portrayed or represented on gold foils are only found in the lower Guadalquivir Valley and to date, no other instance has been uh, detected in the whole of Iberia. So to finish this review and the choice of uh, resources, of course, I cannot fail to mention what perhaps is the most striking find in this tomb, which is these attires that, were, that some of these people, some of these women mostly were uh, wearing when they were buried, and which were made with uh, tens of thousands of perforated beads. Uh, some of these beads were made with uh, stone on stone, and some of them seem to have been made on shell, marine shell. But we still don't have a full analysis and study of this. These uh, um, incredible uh, garments or attires were decorated in some cases with um, pendants made of ivory. As you can see here, this is a little acorn made of ivory. And uh, yeah, some other you know, elements that were adornments, basically, for these, uh, for these um, uh, attires. So to finish, and comparing these two uh, burial contexts, we can say that both uh, Palacio III and Montelirio present carefully selected local materials. They are similar in this. The imagery uh, shows us that rocks were used in a highly patterned way to convey some specific purported meanings. And this, again, is shared between the two tombs. The imagery in itself is represented in different ways. In Palacio III, the red conglomerate, as I explained, has an important protagonism at the entrance of the tomb. In Montelirio, a lot of protagonism is given to red cinnabar, which was used okay, to paint the slabs and the walls of the tomb, both the corridor and the chamber. In the group of nap lithics, uh, moving on into the uh, finds, there's a predominantly non-local flint in both tombs, although in Montelirio there's a very special kind of rock that was used for these long bar uh, uh, arrowheads, which is milonite, which has never been described in Iberian prehistory before. In the group of polished stone, uh, in Palacio III, there is a predominantly non-local rocks, fibrolite and amphibolite standing out. In Monterio, there is no polished stone, which I think is interesting from the point of view of the people who use this tomb. Bodily ornaments, in Palacio, we only, Palacio III, we only have two perforated beads. In uh, Monterio, of course, there's tens of thousands of perforated beads plus ivory, amber, and um, uh, gold. In the Palacio Three Tombs, there are some personal objects, as I explained, that we interpret as charms or amulets made of rocks like chalcedony, milky quartz, and fossil wood. In Montelirio, no uh, object of this type was found. Finally, in the domain of um, representations, sacred representations, or ideotechnic items, at Palacio, there's this one uh, fire clay female figurine. In Montelirio, only the repousse uh, gold foils, which are exceptional. So as a conclusion, 
Uh, whereas in Palacio, there's a variety of uh, pottery forms, um, a series of tools that we could call perhaps everyday uh, daily tools, arrowheads, hand axes, and some personal objects with almost no bodily ornaments. At Montelirio, there is a, a lack, a visible lack of variety of pottery forms, no tools. The uh, arrowheads are artistic objects not meant for use, and no personal objects, although there are super sophisticated and totally special bodily ornaments, including the garments. This suggests that in Palacio III, what we have is a regular, natural human group. Call it a family, a clan, or a community. At Montelirio, on the other hand, we don't seem to have that. We do have the benefit of the anthropological report in this case, because the human remains were found. There is a non-natural uh, group in so far. This could be more like a corporate group. We have interpreted it as a, as a possible group of priestesses. Um, finally, in Palacio III, there is no extra Iberian exotica. And the architecture is, of course, of uh, a regular or small scale, which suggests, are, again, a regular community. At Montelirio, on the other hand, on the other hand, there is a large amount of extra Iberian exotica, ostrich eggshell, ivory amber, and a totally out of the ordinary architecture. All this suggests a powerful community.